Welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm Becky Kaiser. Depression, anxiety, and other mental health conditions are becoming more common in children and teens. In Kansas, suicide is the second leading cause of death for children and teens ages 10 and older. The number of suicide deaths among Kansas teens aged 15 to 19 has been rising since 2013 and is well above the national average. It's estimated that two out of three youth will be exposed to trauma before the age of 16. Traumatic childhood experiences impact how a child views themselves and how they respond to the world around them. We'll learn more about these issues and more with our guest, Taylor Ziegler of Camber Children's Mental Health. Presentation of Doctors on Call on Smoky Hills PBS is made possible in part by an underwriting grant from CAMGO, the state's only Kansas-based medical liability provider, serving medical professionals and advocating for the health for all Kansans. Your family is our family. Staff at Smith County Memorial Hospital wants to set the standard of excellence for health care in North Central Kansas. Children's mental health is our topic this evening on Doctors on Call. We hope that you take the opportunity and give us a phone call 1-800-337-4788. That's toll free with your questions and comments tonight. Taylor Ziegler, our guest, earned a bachelor's degree in nursing and a doctorate in nursing nursing practice at Fort Hayes State University. She is board certified through the American Association of Nurse Practitioners as a family nurse practitioner. She's also certified to teach basic life support classes. Taylor began her career with Camber in 2013 as a behavioral health technician. She's gained experience as a registered nurse, a lead nurse, nursing supervisor, director of nursing, and senior director of nursing while at Camber. Taylor serves on the BSN and DNP Nursing Advisory Boards at Fort Hayes State University, the Nursing Advisory Board at Northwest Kansas Technical College, and the Annual Mental Health Symposium Planning Committee. Taylor is the Vice President of Nursing at Camber Children's Mental Health. Our phone lines are open now. The number again, toll free, 1-800-337-4788 if you have any questions or comments regarding children's mental health on today's show. Doctors on Call brings you information which may be useful to you when you see your own physician or nurse. Well, let's go ahead and get started with some questions for our guests while we wait for our first phone calls to come in. And we want to say welcome, Taylor. And first of all, let's find out what is Camber Children's Mental Health? Where is it and what does it do? Yeah, so Camber Children's Mental Health, we have um, three sites in Kansas. We have our um, site in Hayes, Kansas. We have acute and residential services there. We have um, Kansas City acute and residential services, and then we have an acute hospital in Wichita. Um, we serve children ages 6 to 18, and we treat um, mental health in children, like you said. So um, any acute concerns that they have or those residential um, treatment facilities, the longer term stay that they might need. Well, let's be really specific. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between <clears throat> acute and residential? Yeah, so acute's more um, when children are in that acute crisis stage. So we need to get them in quickly, whether they're from the community or they're in an ER or what have you. Um, they come in, we help them through their crisis, we stabilize them and try to get them into the community within five to seven days. Qu pretty quick turnaround, we want them to be stable to go back to the community, get their outpatient services that they need. Um, they can always come back if they need to. Um, and then residential is a little bit longer term, so these children aren't in acute crisis, but they're not having any symptom improvement with their outpatient services in the community. Um, so they stay around 60 to 90 days with us. What kinds of mental health conditions do you treat? You mentioned children as young mm -hmm. as six. That seems incredibly yes, young. Yes, so we see a wide range. We see lots of anxiety, depression, PTSD, ADHD, um, suicidal thoughts, self-harming, um, lots of that, I would say, is the majority of what we see. And it sounds like those, those uh, situations are on the increase 
among mm -hmm. Kansas teens anyway. Is there anything to attribute that to? I mean, I think that we had, we have to, you know, bring COVID up. I mean, I think that was a big impact for our children. They're very social beings, um, not going to school, maybe losing family members, just a change in their world. Sure. I think that is re really impactful for them and everyone. So I would, I would say that's a big factor that I can think of off the top of my head. What about social media? I was mm -hmm. just listening to a, a story on National Public Radio on the, their evening news mm -hmm. today, actually, and they were uh, talking to someone who has done some research going clear back to when Facebook made its debut on college campuses, mm -hmm. and she's trying to put together some scientific statistics to show that it specifically social media and phone use has had a really negative impact on kids especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's huge. I mean, we don't allow our kids to have their cell phones when they're with us for a reason. So, I mean, I think that's definitely that's definitely something you have to consider as a parent of a, of a young child. You know, we see lots of bullying, lots of um, social media problems that come up. So we see a lot of that. Yeah, and we try to restrict that as much as we can when they're with us. Is that a huge uh, deprivation for the kids? Yeah. No phone? It's yeah. Like I imagine it's like, ah, how am I, I mean, going to get think, by? Yeah, <laughs> probably initially, but they get used to it because no one has them there. None of the other kids have them. So they, they adjust pretty well. Amazing. Yeah. Well, let's talk about um, some, you specifically, you have mm -hmm. quite a, a history of yes. nursing behind you and things that you've accomplished. So your mm -hmm. responsibilities as vice president of nursing at Canberra, what does that entail exactly? Yeah, so I oversee all of the nursing services at our three sites, like I mentioned. So that's working really closely with the directors of nursing at each site, making sure we're staffed and, you know, doing everything we need to do. Um, and, you know, the nurses on site work really closely with other disciplines. So whether that's the behavioral health technicians or the therapists or the doctors. So it's pretty collaborative between me and other vice presidents or directors or whatever that, whatever the role is, just making sure that the client gets the best care that they deserve. How did you get interested in this discipline in the first place? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I was between psychology and nursing. So I, when I chose nursing, I, this is just like a perfect fit. I love working with kids and love working with the people at Canberra, very passionate people. And you are based at the at the Hayes yes. Hospital? Yes, yes, I'm in Hayes. And people in this area may realize that uh, the facility that you're in now on the south west side mm -hmm. of town is actually new and you yeah. and it was there was a huge outcry for the need mm -hmm. yeah we were really excited to get acute beds back in Hayes um, in the January of this year so we have 15 beds for acute and we have around 18 we take for residential there so and we've been consistently pretty full so it was definitely a need that we were happy to meet what um, mental health care what does that mean when we talk about mental health issues and mental health care versus maybe physical care of our bodies what's the difference and how important is it for a child as a child mm -hmm. as young as six able to take care of themselves or is that more of a parental responsibility for mental health i mean i think obviously at canberra we like to think of it as a very holistic approach so we have you know medical doctors and psychiatry team and it's you know the body is one of the same. So, I mean, I think when you talk about mental health, I think we, we think more of like regulating our emotions or dealing how we deal with stress, um, which can impact your physical health and maybe physical symptoms. So I think those are the biggest things that we're just trying to help the kids manage their emotions so they can go to school and build healthy relationships. And sometimes they just struggle with that. So we help them with that. Taylor, some of the things that you just listed there, uh, controlling emotions. Some people might think, you know, that's, hey, isn't that just part of growing up? Mm -hmm. Isn't that just something we all have to learn how to do? And, and you know, you're not always going to get your way and life isn't fair and those are life yeah. lessons. But it's it's difficult for some children, apparently. Yeah, and I mean, trauma impacts that. So we're, we're we do trauma-informed care. So we're always looking at what, what has been the trauma, what's impacted the child, um, and how does that come out and whether that's behaviors or how they respond to certain stimuli or environments that's based on what they've experienced in life. So, so in the home setting, is that what you're Yeah, it could to be. I mean, anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What kind of traumas might be common to a six-year-old, for yeah. example? I mean, I think it varies. You know, even we know when you take, you know, 
tests about your trauma. It can be as little as your parents getting a divorce. It could be sure. physical abuse. It could be sexual abuse. It could be witnessing domestic violence. So there's lots of different things that unfortunately they do experience at, by that age. And really, um, by that ed, age mm -hmm. you say, and what I was thinking, that, that could occur to anybody up to yes. the age of 18 and beyond. Exactly. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Well, let's talk a little bit about CAMBER itself. And some, you talked about a holistic approach mm -hmm. and working with the team together and, and that you like doing that. What advantage does this holistic approach have for a patient? Do you call them patients or are they clients or? Yeah, we call them clients. Clients, okay. Yes, yeah, I mean interchangeably. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's really helpful at CAMBER because we do have the therapists that do individual and family therapy. Um, we have the nurses who are there 24 seven with the behavioral health techs. Um, we have the psychiatry team and the medical team. So they all work very closely and they're aware of what's going on here, might affect their treatment here. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's just very collaborative. We have a treatment team that meets daily for the patients just to discuss how they're doing and, you know, share information on the different teams, so. So, and I know that's what we're talking about at this mm -hmm. point is talking about the, that particular type of care but kids are kids and maybe they're not going to pay attention for a certain mm -hmm. after a certain amount of time and they get bored and want to try something else i know mm -hmm. that having reported on camber as a, a reporter for hayes post and for eagle radio and hayes that there is life outside of the, the medical portion of what you're providing mm -hmm. there yes i mean we definitely look at they go to school i mean our residential kids go to school with us so we're helping them incorporate back into the community we're, a, we're you know it's a very individualized approach if that doesn't work well for one kid we're going to do something else and create a different safety plan for them just to make sure it works they're not they're not all on the same plan i would say so it's very individualized sense. yeah yeah very individualized so what would you say the the tell me what the differences are between how you would work with somebody who is actually an inpatient who is hospitalized mm -hmm. versus somebody who's uh, in the residential treatment or do they stay there full time in the residential treatment? Yeah, they stay there with us. They um, can go on home passes for a weekend or whatever that looks like if they qualify to do that. Um, so they can leave campus, they can leave to go into the community with our staff to go to the park or do an outing. Mm -hmm. And stuff like that the acute kids can't do that they're they're not allowed you know their own clothes um so a little bit of a difference there in what they can do what they can have um just to make sure they're they're allowed a little bit more on residential just because they're not in that acute crisis right yeah um so what area i know we were talking about um that just before you and i came on air we were talking about you have been filled up and there was this huge mm -hmm. need that we were hearing about from western kansas legislators and families and parents and relatives about the need for this particular hospital in western kansas so who is it that you're serving is it primarily western kansas kids yeah we like to prioritize western kansas um, if we can since we do have those other two hospitals but um, if we're for some reason not as full in hayes and there's a kid that kansas city's full we'll take them I mean, we, we do like to keep a few beds open for Western Kansas, though, at all times. This is a very naive question. Mm -hmm. Do you see a difference in the number of patients in a rural area, such as, I know, I'm just going to lump all of Western Kansas in there, mm -hmm. versus, say, Kansas City, that's a much more urban area, mm -hmm. or do kids seem to have the same problems wherever? I would say they have about the same problems. There's probably just maybe more of them in a different area. Yeah, they have about the same problems, I would say. So the, yeah. that makes sense to yeah. me. I think, you know, kids are kids, yeah. regardless of where they're living. Exactly. You know. yeah. So community providers, I know you have this holistic uh, approach, and then you talked about being able to, some of the kids, uh, the residential treatment kids, being able to go off campus on mm -hmm. outings and things like that. What might some of those outings look like? Yeah, I mean, we try to make things fun. Um, like I said, the outings might consist of going to the movies, going to the park, um, if there's certain activity downtown, if the kids can go, um, anything that the community is offering that any other kid would go to, we, if it's appropriate for our kids to go with that amount of kids, we, we try to make it work so they can have, you know, somewhat of a normal experience in those things that a kid should. So this must require a lot of staff members? Yes. It does. There's different like ratios for the acute and residential, so I mean that helps um, for the outings and such. But yes, the definitely the BHTs are a big part of what Camber does. Are you uh, overseen by 
not only the legislature, which I know you are to mm -hmm. a certain degree, but other entities that regulate mm -hmm. such things as how many adults must be with the kids and medical protocols, that sort of thing? Yeah, so I mean, we're um, licensed with KDADS and Joint Commission, so, and CMS, so we have to manage all of those regulations to make sure we're meeting what we need to. Is it hard to do that? Sometimes, but <laughs> it's gotten easier over time, I think. What sort of things are they looking at? What do they want what do they want to regulate exactly? Oh gosh, I mean for the different programs it's different. So I mean there's more um, restrictions on acute and that varies from you know the environment to fire drills to medication management, how you pass the meds. I mean there's a whole array of, of things how they want a hospital to look. Yeah. When we talk about the, the kids who come in and are in an, an acute phase What's another word to use instead of acute? Are they are they uh, in danger of perhaps trying to kill themselves? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, I just like to think of them and they're they're in that acute crisis stage, so they need help right now. Um, some of them do have suicidal thoughts or suicidal ideations. Um, so yeah, that's a big factor that we take into consideration when they come in and getting that history, making sure they're on the right safety precaution. Um, if they're high risk, sometimes we'll change their status precaution to like a one-on-one -on -one as opposed to a different, a different status that you could have a lesser amount of like checking to do. So there, would, there could be somebody with that person, yes, with that client higher all level the time. of precaution, yep. Um, when, a, when a child, and again, I keep going back to, to such young ones, but when a child comes in in that situation, is it generally the parents who bring them in? Or yeah, we see a lot of... Um, parental custody, um, sometimes foster parents. Mm -hmm. um, so if they're in the state's custody and they're in a foster home, we'll see them come in. We get a lot of referrals from emergency rooms. Um, oh, really? Yeah, so that's a big re referral source for us. And whether they're in parents' custody or not, we see a lot of referrals from the ERs and hospitals. Yeah. So the, the child's behavior has just, I guess, become out of control. Yes, and that's kind of the, f the first place that they can go to get them safe and then the ER obviously helps find them a placement if they need to be admitted. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, what do you think, uh, we talked about who Camber serves, but the community providers that I know, you, and you just talked about, obviously you have some sort of uh, working relationship with emergency rooms, mm -hmm. probably law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, what other groups do you have contact with that help bring this service to mm -hmm. these areas? Yeah, I mean, we really like to work with anyone who also works with children and families. So that's a lot of local mental health centers, um, school sure. districts, any family practice that has kids, that sees kids or pediatricians, um, anyone that naturally just sees those kids. We just, we really like to have a working relationship with them. Do you go outside of people who might have a vested interest in, in children? I'm thinking mm -hmm. like, I, thinking back to some of these activities and trips that the, some of the kids go on, do you have opportunity to provide some of those specifically for those kids mm -hmm. at the activities you uh -huh. mean? yeah I mean we try to we try to get as much exposure that we can for them yeah I'm sure that makes you know that's that's just like regular life yes, getting out and doing exactly something, fun, something doing different fun stuff meeting yeah. new people um, we think about mental health and still to this day even though you and I are sitting here talking about it in a, in a pretty matter-of-fact manner it still can be a stigma for some people. And what is it that you would like to tell people, particularly when it comes to kids about mental health, that uh, maybe some of the things that people think are true that really aren't? Mm -hmm. I would say, yeah, I mean, the stigma is a big thing. So I think if you are concerned that your child or someone you know might be having symptoms of depression or anxiety, just talking to them about it is a really good step. Um, that's kind of a first step that I think is really important. Just, you know, see what's going on, what do you need, making sure the environment's safe. Um, that's the biggest thing, I think, is just destigmatizing it. Are we doing a good job in that area? I think it's getting better. I think things impact that, like we talked about, like, you know, social media and phones and that's kind of just ever changing, but I, th I think it's getting better as far as the stigma. Good, yeah. good to hear. Well, we do have a, a caller on the phone with us. I didn't quite understand. I think she's from Alma. You have a comment or a question for Taylor this evening? Yes, I do. I'm an elementary school teacher, and 
I have a student that I think could possibly um, be showing some signs of depression and I just wasn't quite sure how to address it as far as I'm not sure parents would necessarily be on board of um, doing pursuing. I just didn't know, I just need some advice on what I can do to help this child. Good yeah. question. That's a good question. Um, I think that, I mean, it goes back to if it feels like something you're able to do, just talking to the child and asking them, you know, is anything going on? I've noticed maybe you're withdrawing a little bit more, if that's something you feel comfortable doing, or if you have a school counselor that can help with that. Um, I think that's always the first step, just to kind of gauge what's going on. Um, and then again, if, yeah, if you can get parents on board to just kind of talk about that, I think that's helpful. That can be tricky in the school settings. We, we do get lots of questions from school teachers about what can I do, and if you know they're in parent custody, that can be difficult. But I think just continuing to ad advocate for them and bring stuff up at conferences with the, with the parents, I think that's, that's the most you can do. Good advice. Taylor, let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, mental health disorders that we hear I don't want to say tossed around, but they're coming more common as people talk about things and destigmatizing mental health, anxieties, and disorders. Um, and one that you mentioned at the top of the show, ADHD. What is what does that stand for exactly? And it seems like that's something that's becoming more common. Is it something mm -hmm. that needs to be controlled? Yeah, I mean, I think we get a lot of questions about that because naturally, you know, younger children can display some of those symptoms just because they're young children. Sure. So, I mean, I would always recommend people to seek advice from their family doctor or a professional. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely, I think people are maybe are just more aware of it. So maybe that's why we're, we're seeing that it seems to be more common. Um, I would say that, that that might be a big factor right now. What about self-harming? We've heard, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, tell us what that is. And then again, something else we've heard more about. Yes, um, self-harming, I mean, that can vary from any way that, you know, the person does it. We see a lot of cutting um, to the arms or legs or places that you won't necessarily see with clothing on. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen other things like maybe even burns or whether that's with a pencil eraser. Yeah, we see a lot of that. Um, I think that's just a, a coping skill, unfortunately, that's negative that, that kids have developed. That's what they used to cope. So obviously they have to learn a better yes, coping skill. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, a question, we, we kind of touched on this a little bit with the question, the, the person who just phoned in. Can a parent or a guardian request treatment of a child or would it have to come from an emergency room or a physician? Mm -hmm. No, we definitely take community referrals is what we call them. So you can call our admissions line at any time or 24 seven, we have people answering the phone and just you can talk to them about your, your concerns and they will help you determine if your child's uh, meeting the, the criteria for admission at that time. And if not, we, we try to point you in the right direction of what might be more appropriate. Here's a big one that everybody unfortunately has to ask about in this day and age. What about insurance plans? Is there such mm -hmm. a thing at Camber and what do you accept, if any? Yeah, we accept um, most private insurances we accept in Kansas and Missouri Medicaid. And then at our Hayes treatment facility, we actually accept um, Colorado Medicaid as well. And uh, insurance for health care, mental health care mm -hmm. is more common than it used to be. In, is mm -hmm. that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I think I, I remember when it, it, not so long ago it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And now it's like it's just included in your package. Yeah, so. exactly. I mean, that's the hope. Yes, exactly. Um, what kind of stage, you mentioned this, I think, at the beginning, but remind people that if they have a child that needs to stay at Camber, potentially how long might that be? Does it depend on why they're there in the first place? Yeah, it depends on why they're there, you know, how their stay goes, if they're, you know, improving or not. Um, but like that acute hospitalization is around that five to seven days and then um, residential is around that 60 to 90 days. 60 to 90. And mm -hmm. you said it's it's possible that a child might come back for additional care. Yes. Yep. Or if they've, you know, been in acute several times and they're not improving in the community, then they might qualify for a residential stay at that point. All right. And uh, we have just about a minute left in our show. What about talking to kids about some of these, there's gonna be major trauma in all of our mm -hmm. lives. How does a parent or a guardian talk to a kid about how to handle that well, mm -hmm. come out healthy on the other side? 
Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just to create a safe environment for them to talk about it. So that means that you can't make them feel silly or stupid for asking a question. There's no dumb question. Like this that. is a safe space. Um, don't shame them for how they feel. Definitely validate their feelings. We don't have to agree with everything they say, but definitely validate, let them be heard. And then, um, I mean, going from there, just asking what you can do to help, um, whether that's at home or at school and how you need to advocate for them. All right. Well, thank you so much, Taylor yes, Ziegler. We've been you. visiting with Taylor Ziegler from Camber Children Mental Health Center. And also we want to thank her on behalf of the staff of Smoky Hills PBS. Thank you for joining us this evening. For Doctors on Call, I'm Becky Kaiser. Presentation of Doctors on Call on Smoky Hills PBS is made possible in part by an underwriting grant from CAMGO, the state's only Kansas-based medical liability provider, serving medical professionals and advocating for the health for all Kansans. Your family is our family. Staff at Smith County Memorial Hospital wants to set the standard of excellence for health care in North Central Kansas.